Uh, James Boyle uh, is the William Neal Reynolds Professor of Law at Duke, at Duke Law, and he's also the co-founder of the Center for Study of the Public Domain, um, and we're very excited to have him here today. Um, he's also the author most recently of The Public Domain, Enclosing the Commons of the Mind, uh, which you should all read. Uh, I've been reading it this week and very pleased with it. Uh, I just want to say one thing about James Boyle, um, but in order to do that, uh, I need to talk about Creative Commons uh, just briefly. Uh, uh, Jamie was starting Creative Commons and definitely played a big role in expanding its reach recently uh, as the board of directors for Creative Commons. Uh, Creative Commons is a tool which enables sharing. Uh, it provides artists, photographers, writers, uh, anyone with an easy way to say some rights reserved instead of all rights reserved. Uh, and just to say, you know, you can use my work. Um, it does that uh, by providing people with easy to use licenses, uh, which are both lawyer readable, meaning they're legally sound documents that lawyers can understand, and they're also human readable, meaning people like us, uh, the non-lawyers in the audience, uh, uh, and myself, uh, can also understand. Um, so I just thought that was a great uh, a metaphor. Is, uh, Jamie does the same thing uh, in his writing and speaking. He makes arguments and tells stories in ways that are both lawyer-readable, they're legally sound, and they're also human-readable. So. We're very glad to have him here tonight, and thank him very much for coming. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Adam and Kathy, to ACES and the Center for Media Law. Um, this is, um, Adam, you should know, has organized this event superbly well, and is someone who is often the victim of, um, shall we say, uh, idiosyncratic organizing arrangements. I really appreciate that. I particularly like the person who scheduled me in a room in which uh, dinner was being served at the same time so that I had to yell while the silverware was being dropped and the chafing dishes were being put down. Uh, but uh, this, this was as smoothly organized as, as, as could, be, could possibly be imagined. Um, I, I, my titles cause confusion, particularly to European audiences who are unused to people holding named chairs. So one blogger said in a puzzled way, this is James Boyle. He claims to be William Neal Reynolds. <laughs> that, however, was not the best blog posting on me. It was the one that said, he is a leading expert on the study of the pubic domain. <laughs> Which he claims is the fount of all creativity. True, but... <laughs> Not, not an original insight to me, I think. Uh, I think Freud was the, the one who pretty much uh, came up with that one. Um, it's a delight to come to, uh, to UNC. When I first was being recruited by Duke, the, the people at UNC were uh, one of the main attractions in being here, just incredible concentration of talent. Many, many uh, wonderful colleagues over here, Paul Jones, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, Kathy, Lolly Gassaway, many people at the law school and around the campus. And, uh, and I was saying to Duke, you know, it's like, it's so great having UNC here, you know, you know, every time UNC basketball is playing, um, unless they're playing Duke, I root for them. And there was a long pause. <laughs> and my colleague goes, so the Carthaginians didn't root for the Romans, and the Romans didn't root for the Carthaginians, and this is worse than that. <laughs> So I, I continue in my naive ways to uh, be a, a booster, at least in the non-basketball related aspects of UNC. So um, I want to start off by talking about some things that were, were true um, uh, once and are now not true. Um, this is a sad one. Uh, all of the people in this room, even the really young ones, um, uh, the following is true of them, that absent a conscious decision by an author, you will not be able freely to build upon the work of some other creative individual who gets a copyright in their work uh, during your lifetime. No one who produces works uh, in this country, whether they are movies or books or photographs or music, unless they actively say, I want people to be able to use that, none of those works will be available for you to freely build on. When Jefferson was writing in Monticello, he could look out on the sea of works, uh, books and know that in 14 years, uh, he could republish those books. He could translate them, indeed 
anyone could translate them immediately because copyright law didn't cover that then. Uh, in the, um, even as late as 1976, 1978 even, um, copyright initially lasted for 28 years and then it had to be renewed. And 85% of people didn't renew on books. So just think of that for a moment. 85% of all of the works produced 28 or more years ago would be available for us to use, to build on freely, to make adaptations, to make a movie of, to do a braille version, to do a large print edition, to make a stage play, to adapt, to turn into a libretto, right? 85%. Uh, now the percentage uh, is zero. Um, at least zero from that period of time. Copyright now lasts for your life plus 70 years. Uh, you get that whether you want it or not. That's the second thing that is true now that was not true then. In 1976, if you had written a poem or a song or taken a home video, you might have thought, I don't want to copyright this. I don't think I need to. And so if you didn't copyright it, if you didn't, if you didn't affirmatively say copyright James Boyle, 1976, that work went immediately into the public domain. What that meant was that 99.9% .9 of all fixed human culture went immediately into the public domain. Copyright only covered an incredibly narrow slice of commercially produced culture, as indeed it should. That was true, but it also really didn't matter because all that culture, the poem you wrote to your adolescent love, the, the Super 8 movie that you took way back when, the, the draft of the novel that one day was going to be the great American novel and never quite got finished, it was in your sock drawer. Now, in theory, it was available for everyone else to build on, but unless they were in your sock drawer too, <laughs> it really wasn't. <laughs> and exactly. So, as a result, there was this realm of openness in what we might call informal or non-commercial culture. That was the default. The default was open. Copyright was a choice you had affirmatively to make. And once you had affirmatively made it, then you had to affirmatively choose to renew it. You could renew it, and the most highly commercially successful ones did. First 28 plus 28, then 28 plus 56, and 75, and then life plus 50, and then life plus 70. But we got rid of the, the, comp the compulsory renewal uh, in the 1970s. So now, two things are happening that, were, that weren't true once but now are. Everything is sucked into copyright. Everything that is fixed in material form that is original expression. And it doesn't come out. That's why they call it the 20th century black hole. Just like a black hole, Copyright is an irresistible force, apparently, pulling things in to a dark and inaccessible realm from which they cannot escape. That proposition I have not yet demonstrated, but I hope to in the course of this lecture. What other things are true, uh, were true once that are not true now? Until about 15, maybe 10 years ago, books were the realm of accessible culture, the most accessible form of culture that we had, books and journals perhaps, but books in particular. There's informal knowledge, it was in your head, you were a good doctor, you are a good law professor, but there was a ton of stuff in there, but other people couldn't get it unless they were in the room with you. But put it in a book, and the book goes out to libraries and bookstores, and at least in theory, though it might be hard, someone else can go and get that. That was the realm of literacy, when Jefferson was, right, was talking about the, the copyright clause in the American Constitution, one of the things that was on his mind was giving incentives to people to fix things in material form and get them out there, right? Move those books across the continent. Get them into remote libraries. It's not an accident that's the same generation that really invent the circulating library, right? This is the idea of let's make it accessible. Get it out of their heads, the apprentice's head. Get it onto paper and make it available for the world to build on. This is the Scottish Enlightenment vision of progress through learning, right? A deeply attractive vision, at least to me, because I'm from Scotland. What happened now, one of my students came in the other day and was talking about this, this um, uh, note that he was writing, and he'd mentioned 
this exhaustive research he'd done, and he'd you know, looked on this, and this blog posting had done this, and he'd found this uh, article on e-reserve, and he'd done this whatever, and I said, well, have you looked at this book? And he said, a book? No. How would I find something in a book? And the point was, of course, he's right. That in terms of ease of discovery, books are now, they seem to uh, this current generation, these bizarre objects. Like, where's the metadata? Is it in the back? <laughs> no. Where's the mouse over? I keep waving my hand over it. Nothing pops up. Like, what's going on here? So we have a technological change, a change in our assumptions about accessibility. It used to be that we assumed that books were made technologically more accessible through the wonder of printing. And then we develop, developed a technology which was much, much more accessible, much stronger, much richer, and we invented search engines and ways of mining, which made information progressively more accessible to us, such that now this seemed like an incredibly recalcitrant, difficult, inaccessible form of culture. It's not that you couldn't learn how to use it, that's what librarians are for, right? What, which is, amazes me why more people don't go and ask them how to find things. Um, that's what the basic skills acquired in a humanities degree. That's what the critical skills that you should learn in university help you to do. They help you use indexes. They help you crack the books. They help you track the mental models that your mentors have of the literature and perhaps integrate them into your own. And that's great, and I love it, and I celebrate it, and I'm a participant in it, but it's not as easy as typing things into Google. Right? And that's just a fact. So a legal, a set of legal changes, everything goes into copyright, it doesn't come out. A set of technological changes. What's the result of those two, three combined sets of changes? Imagine the Library of Congress as a giant pie. Now, in terms of that pie, what percentage of, let's just start with the books, what percentage of those books are commercially available? Uh, Tim O'Reilly did an interesting calculation. You can argue with the statistics quite easily, um, but I think it's a good baseline. 32 million titles in OCLC catalog, 1.2 million titles sold at least one copy last year. That's about 4%. So that's of this library, this huge pie, right? We've got about 4% that is commercially available. The other 96% not commercially available. So that means that even that if you want something in that 96%, you have to live near a library. Um, and if it's an obscure book, one of the world's great libraries. And you have to have a set of skills to know the book is out there, to be able to find it, a set of resources to get there, um, let alone the idea of maybe mapping all of the knowledge that's in that 96%, combining it, finding patterns, l forming linkages, doing research with it. How do the usages of words change, for example, right? We can't even imagine doing that stuff, right? That's impossible. This is the inaccessible realm of culture we're talking about, books. But those of you who think I'm making an attack on books, don't get me wrong, I, I am a bibliophile. I mean, I basically have my, check, my uh, paycheck deposited directly to the bookstore because it's simpler. So it's not that I'm a book loather. Uh, it's that I'm a realist about the differences in technological accessibility. So 4% commercially available. Um, interestingly, of that percentage that's commercially available, um, some of those uh, works are actually not under copyright. There's a lot of public domain greats in there. You know, the, the, the Kiplings, the Melvilles, the, the Shakespeare's, right? All, all of that stuff is actually in the public domain. Um, so, the, so there's, so there's uh, but, but of the 96% the, uh, of the, the commercially unavailable, a large percentage is still under copyright. How large? Well, that's very hard to figure out. Um, it's hard to figure out because publishing rates change, because rates of retention of books change, uh, and because copyright law is hard to understand. Um, you could be relatively sure that anything published after, uh, before 1923 is in the public domain, at least if it's published in the United States. Uh, after that time, it gets a little bit more complicated. But an enormous percentage uh, of that, 95% uh, of commercially unavailable books, is still under copyright. So that means they're commercially unavailable, 
And so you might say, well, great, I'll print them then. I'll get a copy from the library and I'll put out a new edition and then it will be commercially available, except you can't do that, of course, because they're still under copyright. So of that percentage, commercially unavailable, but still under copyright, the biggest problem is with the so-called orphan works. And here I know, given the, the number of librarians uh, in the audience, that I am, I am preaching to the choir. But um, nevertheless, I think it's worth going over some of the details. Uh, despite the fact that copyright law used to require registration, uh, and still requires registration in order to sue uh, anyone, uh, it is enormously hard to find the copyright holders uh, of copyrighted works. Um, publishing houses have closed, authors have moved, heirs have different names, corporations have folded. In some cases, movies for example, there may be two or even three copyrights on the work. One over the script, one over the, the video itself, one over the soundtrack, and there might be more than that. So to find it means you would have to find all of those people. And copyright is a strict liability system, which means we don't care you're a good person. It's still breaking the law when you copy it or make a derivative work or translate it, right? It's still um, a violation of copyright. So even though the odds are that in many cases um, there is no copyright holder, libraries have to and individuals are well advised to be very conservative about the policies they have. Most great libraries in the United States, for example, that have film holdings will tell you two things. The first thing is that 50% of our film heritage is now orphan works. This is particularly tragic for films made on nitrate, uh, which are literally turning to dust. The copyright term is longer than their effective life, right? which means that by the time we can use them freely, there will be no them to use. 50% are probably orphan works, particularly the percentage, likely percentage goes back, uh, goes up uh, more as we move back through time. But those same uh, great institutions will probably tell you that they simply cannot allow people to uh, view the movies. Perhaps if you're an authorized scholar, yes. Uh, but viewing in a large, you know, showing it in here, no. Uh, we can't do that because it is probably under copyright and to find out would cost an enormous amount of money, right, to find out for a single film, let alone for everything in the catalog. So now here's a second layer of inaccessibility. It's not just that the video, the, the movie, the reel sitting in there from 1934 or the, the, the home movie that somebody, that some African American family made about what life was like, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the segregated South which you get, which is like, of course this person would want it to be seen, but it's probably, might be under copyright, I can't show it. All of that material is not just technologically inaccessible in the sense that you can't just click to get it. It's legally inaccessible. We can't put it up on the web um, without spending an enormous amount of money and perhaps not even then. So how did we get here? Um, how on earth did we come to this place where we went from copyright lasting for 14 years, renewable for another 14, as late as uh, uh, 1978, only initially lasting for, 20, for 28 years, to this point where copyright lasts for life plus 70 or 95 years for corporate works for hire. Well, a couple of things happen. Remember those 85% of people who didn't renew at the end of their 28-year term? That meant 15% did, right? Because I um, have all the math skills common to most lawyers. <laughs> so 15% did. and. That's only 28 years. After 56 years, an even smaller percentage would want to keep going. And after 75, smaller. But at the end of the race, there would still be some winners still standing. My guess is Harry Potter will be one of those. And, you know, but who knows? Perhaps not. There are many works that were uh, great favorites in the Victorian era that people have never heard of today. Um, those works. Uh, the music of Gershwin, for example. It's no accident that uh, Rhapsody in Blue was uh, composed in 1924. The effective date for the public domain is 1923. Uh, Mickey Mouse is often mentioned. Um, many of the uh, great works, obviously, of the literary works of the 30s that people are still buying for college classes. Those people basically 
I wouldn't say win the lottery because they do it through talent and skill and genius. Um, absolutely fine that they, they have that. But they are at the end of the race, at the end of the period, however long the copyright term is, there's some percentage, four, three, two, one percent of people who still could get royalties if that copyright kept going. And they really don't like the idea of their copyrights expiring. And so they say, well, we should extend copyright. And this is the key part, we should do it retrospectively. In other words, all of the others, imagine it as a kind of long baton death march with works falling by the wayside one by one until only the pitiful few stragglers of commercially viable ones emerge to lobby Congress. All those other ones, the, the, the commercially not available works back there, though they are commercially unavailable and thus unaccessible in the market sense, though they are trapped in paper form and thus unaccessible in the technological sense, though they are rare and scattered over libraries and thus inaccessible in the physical sense, we're going to extend copyright over them retrospectively. And what that will do is it will make those works inaccessible. Now, the, for the works that are still available, it's actually fine. You can go out and buy them, right? And markets work very well at distributing goods and services. Occasionally, we may have some you know, question about how they work, healthcare maybe. Uh, but it, they work pretty well in most cases. But the point is, of course, in these other works, you can't. You can't go out and buy them. And so what we have is a system where we deliberately locked up about 90 some percent of the culture since 1923 that was commercially unavailable in order to benefit maybe, and I'm talking about the retrospective copyright extension here, two or three percent. Now, in some heroic cases, you might be able to find, if it was really important to you, the author, the publishing house, get the rights cleared, and maybe get one of those commercially unavailable books made available again in book version. It would be expensive, it would be difficult, one could imagine doing it. But with the orphan works, the ones where we can't find the authors, by definition, that is impossible. So those works become completely inaccessible except where they sit in libraries. There is no way of doing it because the law has locked them up. Remember, although copyright may seem to you like an arcane and meaningless ritual practiced by high priests who charge high hourly rates, it actually was supposed to have a purpose. The purpose was to make culture available to people. That's what copyright was supposed to do. It was supposed to give incentives for the production and dissemination of culture. Dissemination too. It was supposed to provide access. That was the goal. That's why Jefferson wanted it, he actually thought seriously about offering land grants instead, 40 acres and a mule for your novel. Um, uh, they, they were more interested actually in, in ripping off um, industrial secrets from the British and the French. Uh, America in those days was the ultimate pirate nation. Um, but, uh, though it has changed its views somewhat. Um, but we ended up with copyright on the theory that so long as the copyright term was short, we could have the incentive, get the thing out there, and then it would fall into the public domain very quickly, whereupon we could all build upon it, republish it, etc. Market competition would bring prices down, everybody wins. All of this might not have been as tragic as it is, was, if we hadn't also developed the World Wide Web. This is I think we're, we have lived through, I have lived through, one of the most mar remarkable transformations in the history of the species' relationship to its own culture. Uh, the web has transformed that. Um, don't you sometimes have the feeling, a podcaster I, I talked to called it the right-click universe, that when I look at this building, I, there ought to be a mouse over that just <laughs> provides me that. And this is exactly. Um, our, our assumptions about knowledge, the way we perceive the world, our assumptions about, I wonder what the uh, best Thai restaurant in Raleigh is, right? That, that's just, it's completely different than the relationship of prior generations to culture. In other words, and remember that we made these fateful decisions in 76 and 98, very close to the time of the web, we managed all that time through the invention of copyright, 1710, Statute of Anne, up to uh, 1976, 1998, within you know, a year of the invention of the World Wide Web. And that's when we decided to lock everything up so that it couldn't go onto the World Wide Web. It's brilliant. 
right at the moment when the technology would have made it possible for us to digitize all of this stuff and make it available to the world, we said, you can't do it. That's the 20th century black hole. That's the crime of the century to which I speak. In other words, even if you think that extending copyright for Disney, for Gershwin, was the best thing that could possibly be done, I would make the following modest arguments. Retrospectively extending copyright has little incentive effect on dead authors. <laughs> I, I just, it, you know, occasionally the seance may, may come up differently, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be bold and put that one out there. Um, it really doesn't have an incentive effect. It merely acts as a deadweight loss uh, on our culture. And in this case, um, it is one of the stupidest pieces of policy making that I have ever encountered. Um, and one that we made with cavalier disregard for its effect on our access to our culture. As I said, we are the only generation who will look around and say, wow, absent a distinct decision by our creator, I will be able to build on none of the works produced by my fellow citizens during my entire lifetime. None. That's really quite remarkable. Enter Google. There have been a number of attempts, I have to say they've been relatively half-hearted until recently, to solve this problem, at least for the orphan works. It's very hard to argue that anyone is benefiting for the orphan works where there is no copyright holder or we can't find them, for the works being unavailable. It just is a really hard argument to make. Uh, in fact, just to give you a sense of this, here's a policy that would be, I would say, a thousand times more rational than our current policy. Take the current net receipts for all of the works that are still under copyright that are, let's say, more than 75 years old. So whatever, whatever Mickey Mouse earned last year, whatever uh, Gone with the Wind earned last year, and say, out of the public fisc, out of general taxes, we'll pay you that plus 10%, and we'll compound it by 5% every year, maybe capped at a certain point. Um, and you get that, so you get a, more than you're now getting, more money than you're now getting. But in exchange, all the stuff that's commercially unavailable and that's orphan works goes into the public domain immediately. What's the political possibility that would pass? Zero. Wait, you're saying you're going to tax us in order to give money to millionaires who, whose works are this old? Why would you do this? It's true. It would be incredibly politically stupid. It is, however, a thousand times more sensible than what we actually did, which was to give them that and to lock up all the stuff which was commercially unavailable and all the orphan works, right? So my stupid proposal is a lot more sensible than our actual reality. So what were the proposals to fix this? Well, people proposed, well, there ought to be something, at least for the orphan works, not the commercially unavailable ones that, that where there is an author, but for the orphan works where so long as you make best efforts, you go out there, you look at the copyright register, you try you know, a Google search, you use, you go to various libraries, see if there's any information on the person, go through a set of steps, that if you at least do that, you ought to be able to copy or uh, to reproduce, to make derivative works from the uh, copyrighted work. And then if an author actually c turns up, you have to either take it down or pay them some share of the revenue, right? Very reasonable proposal and one that has consistently failed to pass uh, in most jurisdictions. They have a very anemic form of it in Cal Canada, the United States. They tried to produce such a bill last year and it was, um, it was, it was never able to get through. And, and even if it had been able to get through, it was incredibly modest. It wouldn't have given effective access to orphan works. So um, when uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin actually started Google early in the time when they started Google. They started thinking about books because it had did struck them that there was it struck them as bizarre that someone's you know profane ramblings on their blogspot page were easily findable, and yet the classics of literature were completely inaccessible. This didn't seem to make much sense to them. The technological uh, change that I described seem bizarre to them, and since they are geeks and wear that, that label proudly, they said, well, we'll use technology to fix it. Um, it turned out that initially that was, that was too much for them to swallow, but as Google became more successful, they, uh, they returned to the idea. 
And so they um, started a plan to scan books in libraries, uh, first around the country and then around the world, digitally to scan them using high-tech scanners, which can reach speeds of 1,000 pages uh, an hour, although that's only with books that aren't fragile, um, producing <laughs> of the copyright over the work? Is it, a, is it a rich artistic work or just largely a, a thin work over just sort of facts and, 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 and descriptions? And finally, the effect on the market for the work. And you look at those four factors and figure out whether or not this is a fair use. And as Google lawyers looked at this and as they looked at some of the recent case law, they decided, we think it is a fair use. Now, on its surface, you might think they were wrong. They are, for commercial purposes, bad. Scanning works, much of which are within the core of copyright protection, thick protection, bad, right? They're using 100%. They're copying 100% of the work, bad. And clearly, if there were a market for this work, they are, you know, there might be an interference with it. Bad, 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 bad. But that's a first level analysis. On the second level, it actually gets much more complicated. Um, much of um, IP turns out to be about porn. I don't know why this is the case. Um, <laughs> porn has always been a driver of technologies. Um, there are actually a substantial, actually a, a quite respectable um, group of people who argue that porn has been the driver of every significant communications technology. Um, I have to say, I don't think radio so much, but, um, but certainly others. <laughs> um, and in an interesting case called uh, uh, Perfect 10 versus Google, I guess it's not really porn. Perfect 10 sells um, pictures of naked women. That's its business. And uh, Google image search duly searches the Perfect 10 website. And Google image search doesn't copy the picture in its original form. Instead, it copies a thumbnail version, right? The little tiny thing. Because obviously, when you're looking through Google image search, you need to have a picture to know if it's the right thing you're looking for, since the words are generally completely non-descriptive. Um, and consequently, Perfect 10 um, gets all of these little thumbnails of its pictures displayed on the Google page. And then if you want to see more, you can actually get the uh, larger picture. But that resides still on the Perfect 10 page. It is framed. It is not on the Google servers. And it generally has some you know, watermark over it, which makes it unattractable to the discerning collector of soft porn. <laughs> I presume. Um, so um, Perfect 10 sued and followed exactly the line that I just gave you. Hmm. For commercial purposes, they are copying works in which they're taking 100% of the work. All of the photo is there, even if it's smaller. Clearly, these are highly expressive works. Um, if, look at the choice of camera angles alone. Um, uh, and clearly this has, and in fact did have, a negative effect on Perfect Ten's market. One of Perfect Ten's best argument was that apparently there's a big market for camera phone porn. There are lots of things about my fellow citizens that I really don't like learning. That was one of them. <laughs> camera phone. So you can look at porn on your camera. 
because, you know, sometimes you just can't wait to get home to the computer, right? So I, or I don't know, whatever. Um, it's a thriving market, believe, it, uh, believe me. The court said, actually, you're wrong. First of all, this isn't just a commercial use. Yes, commercial use is normally bad, but not if it's transformative. Think of a parody, right? Parodies are distributed commercially, but they're transformative for the original work, and there, the fact that it's commercial, we don't count against you, because after all, how else would you get your parody out there? How exactly are they transforming these? Well, those of you who study semiotics will be absolutely delighted. They go, this isn't the picture qua picture. This is a sign of the picture. It is a marker for the picture. It is a pointer to the picture. It is a, this is where you can find a picture of this naked woman, rather than the naked woman herself. Uh, Umberto Eco would be delighted. So, um, and perhaps even de Saussure. So what we have here is them saying, no, what they're doing here is taking something and they're actually using it only for the purpose of search. This is the purpose of allowing you to find it. So they aren't copying it to make it the same thing. They are copying it for a transformative purpose. And then the court went through the other factors and said, you know, there may be a slight market harm because the people who look, get their work on their camera phone uh, may actually be able to use these little postage stamp size pictures. That might be a substitute for them. But even so, we don't think it's a big enough deal. Uh, and so they said it was a fair use. So second thought, what's a court doing here? The court is being transformative. The court is looking at the purposes of fair use. Fair use was supposed to be the holes in the copyright cheese that allowed the cheese to live up to its potential, that allowed the copyright system to fulfill its goal of dissemination. How do you disseminate? Well, you incentivize, you encourage distribution, but you also have to encourage Access. Now, access to soft porn is not, so far as I know, one of the enumerated rights in the Bill of Rights, although arguably covered by the penumbra of the First Amendment. But access to culture is very important. And how will you find the culture if there's no way to search? The court looked at it and said, this is an incredibly pro the goals of copyright thing to do. Search is good. Search is good just as incentivizing authors are good. We shouldn't assume that the authors write trumps this transformative search technology. What was Google Book Search? Google Book Search was a, uh, is a system which allowed you to put in search terms and if the book was out of copyright, you got the whole thing. If the book was in copyright, you got a snippet view. So here was Google's argument. Yeah, we copied it, but we didn't copy it to give you the book. We copied it because that's the only way we could search it. Right? This isn't a copy qua copy, it's a copy as sign, a copy as pointer. Right? In other words, in the old days, when you wanted to find something, you went to your professor who knew Shakespeare backward and forward and said, where's that line about the rose? And he goes, oh, that's in Henry V. And you go, oh, I knew it was there. And you went there. And that wasn't a violation of copyright because reading and remembering things is not yet a violation of copyright. <laughs> yet. We have our plans because it's not fixed, because reading is not a reproduction, a fixation, it's simply something that you can do. You can walk into a bookstore and read the whole book and put it back and you're not violating copyright. You may make the store owner very angry, but you're not violating copyright. Yeah. yeah. So what this is doing, what Google Book Search was doing, was trying to make that possible, to make it possible within the world of the net technology. And the way that they did that was to give you this tiny snippet view, a view which if you had excerpted it alone, i.e. if this were all you had copied, these 20 or 30 words, would have been pretty clearly a fair use. Um, and Google's argument was, this will actually make this great reservoir of work findable, searchable, accessible for the first time. Um, notice at this point Google was not planning to sell these works. That is to say, you couldn't download the work if it was in copyright, unless they made an explicit deal with the copyright holder. Um, and they weren't even planning um, to make available the orphan works in full. But they were sued um, by a, two groups, publishers and authors, representing a number of publishers and authors, certainly not all. Um, and we waited with bated breath. Um, my guess is that 
Had the case gone to trial, it would depend on the court. But had the case gone to trial, I think there's about a 65 to 70 percent chance that the court would have said it was fair use. But you know, you ask another copyright professor, they'll say 50-50, and another one will say 35-65. So it's it's that's my read. I could well be wrong. I certainly have been before. Um, and Google, having smart lawyers and being responsible to its stockholders, said, well, you know, it would be. Um, you know, this, this is a risky litigation. The damages, if we're found liable, could be in the hundreds of millions, billions of dollars because American copyright law is a very high statutory damages. And what's more, we want to be creative. Um, maybe we could get a settlement which would allow even more than the Google Book Search currently makes available. And so they entered into a proposed settlement with um, the Authors Guild and the publishers. And the proposed settlement um, is incredibly complicated. It's 128 and some pages, lots of appendices. But the core is pretty simple. Um, Google puts a chunk of money out there, uh, with about 120 million, I think, uh, to the Authors Guild, which, and they, they establish a fund. And the fund is going to be used to pay authors and publishers, rights holders, the people who actually have copyright over this stuff, uh, which Google's going to make available. Um, this is the key part of the system. It's an opt-out system. That is to say, any publisher who wants can say, take all these works out of your index, take them off your system, you may not do this. And they can do that at any time. But they have to actually say, these are my works, this is the, this is the ISBN number, or this is the title, and take it out, and then Google will take it out. Why an opt-out system? Why not an opt-in system? It's the orphans, dummy, right? If you have an opt-in system, by definition, you immediately lose all the orphans because there is no one to speak for them. So it's an opt-out system. And it's not just the orphans, frankly. It's also the, you know, the rights owner who can be identified, but frankly, just doesn't care. Right? And that's a, probably a very large percentage also. So this pot of money is going to be distributed um, and as future money is accumulated by the advertising and by sales of the books themselves, it will be distributed and I think uh, the, the publishers and authors get about 60, 66, 70 percent uh, of the total and Google uh, gets the remainder. Um, that's the plan. One of the things that is wonderful about this is that you would still be able to use Google Book Search. Another of the things that's wonderful about it, for the first time, you would actually be able to pay as an individual to buy a copy of the orphan work and be able to view the whole thing. And that money, of course you don't know it's an orphan work or not, that money would go into this big pot of money, pot of funds, and anyone who came forward would be a claimant who could get some there. So if the orphan person came forward, they would be able to get a, a chunk of the money. If they didn't, they wouldn't. Google would price all of these books at a scale starting, I think, at $1.99 and going up to $29.99, 12 different steps. They have a pricing algorithm, which, you know, if it's as good as their search algorithm, that might probably be pretty good. Um, and that would also be true for the commercially unavailable ones that do have a copyright holder. So now this stuff could be bought. It would exist only on your computer, right? So that's a downside. It would be tied to your Google account. Libraries and institutions would have a different kind of subscription. That one would get them more rights, but it would only be a yearly one. They would have to re-up every year. And then one computer in every library, any library anywhere in America, would have full access for free. Right? So that is the magic computer, where on that computer, you can get access to everything. Right? So that's the settlement idea. There's a lot more, believe me, but the, the bare bones are there. Um, and what happened was there was initially people went, wow. A lot of us went, oh, I really wish they litigated it because I think they would have won the fair use case. A lot of people went, thank God they didn't litigate it because I think they would have lost the fair use case. Um, and for a long time, the Publishers Guild and the Authors Guild uh, made a noise about it, but other people didn't. And then, really interestingly, a group of uh, people who should be heroes to librarians, the open, uh, some of the archivists and uh, librarians in the Open Content Alliance, who bizarrely had been working with Microsoft and Yahoo also to digitize and make books available. Yahoo and Microsoft folded their effort. They decided they couldn't do it su successfully. Those people, including people like Brewster Kahle of the Internet Archive, Pamela Samuelson, a close friend of mine and colleague at, at, at Bolt, started saying, this is a terrible settlement. And we think there are things really wrong with the settlement. What's wrong with the settlement? Well, their concerns differed. I think it's fair to say that Microsoft and Yahoo's concerns were perhaps less public interested than Brewster Kahle's and Pamela Samuelson's. Um, they felt that this would give Microsoft a, um, an unbreakable commercial advantage um, in search. 
The first thing was that Microsoft would become a de facto, not a legal, but a de facto monopoly over all of commercially unavailable copyrighted uh, works and orphan works. Now, not quite, because those, the commercially unavailable people could opt out at any point. The orphans, of course, would not. Um, but they, and only they, would have both the registry that contained all the titles and information, the metadata on that, plus the actual copies, the digital information on all of those books. And if you think about it, a lot of the interesting uses that might be found for this, a lot of people saying search is the least interesting. We can, there might be text mining that could be due. There could be patterns there. I mean, this could generate thousands of dissertations a year. This could, you know, in, you know cultural research could be transformed. I mean, there, there's a lot more here once you start thinking about it, which we've never ever been able to do. We've never thought, we haven't even got the mental tools to imagine what we might do because we've never really thought seriously about what it would mean to have digital access to a large proportion of printed human culture. Um, so they say, well, Microsoft will have, excuse me, uh, Google will have a monopoly over this. And the, what do we not like about monopoly? They can charge what they want. Uh, they seem like they're charging very, you know, fairly reasonably right now, but who knows what would happen in the future. They will control um, uh, access to it in different ways, uh, particularly the fact that, you know, your books would be on their system, similar to the problems with the Amazon Kindle. We're worried about privacy. Uh, I go to a library and, thank goodness, librarians, many of them, are civil libertarians and stand firm, even against the Patriot Act, in saying that actually <laughs> well, we shouldn't be like, giving out uh, the, 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 the information about who, uh, who um, checked out this book. And if I go to a bookstore, I can pay in cash and no one even knows I bought you know, the anarchist cookbook or whatever it is that I've just bought. But if it's through Google, then there is information. What would the privacy controls be? Um, so privacy, apart from monopoly. Um, and then they also felt this would really just stifle competition in this area. Um, we want there to be a hundred uh, such systems, they said, to which Sergey Brin responded, in order to be a hundred, the first has to be one. Which is actually a pretty good answer, I have to say, uh, even though I think they have a point. What do I think of these criticisms? I think a lot of them are well-founded. Um, a number of people, uh, Tim Wu, um, I've said it, a number of other people said it, have looked at Google and said, you know, the more you look at this, the more it looks like a public utility with a natural monopoly. You probably don't have competing water vendors to your house. You probably don't have competing electricity vendors to your house. You do have competing phone vendors. You probably have maybe two choices on how to get broadband, right? In the cases where we have only a single uh, entity providing it where there are l large economies of scale that you don't have to dig two sets of water pipes. It doesn't really make much sense. Um, but where this would enable monopoly pricing, so a private entity is producing something that is very publicly good. We like the clean water stuff, right? Uh, we like the electricity stuff, but we don't want to have seven different electrical systems so I can shift from one to the other. What we generally do is impose limitations. We impose limitations on pricing, uh, access, their ability to take things away, certain due process limitations, and so forth. So some people have said, well, that's what we should do here. We should come in and we should impose all of those limitations, which sounds like a wonderful idea, except, of course, you also have to remember that at a certain point, this deal will break down. That is to say, Google and the uh, authors and publishers on the other side will walk away for it. They, there aren't an infinite number of conditions we can impose on them. They are private parties agreeing to judicial settlement. A second set of concerns is this isn't the kind of thing that should be done in a courtroom. This should be done in Congress. Wait, Congress was the one that created the problem, right? I mean, there was an irony here. I, this is something that almost no one ever mentions. Let's give it back to the legislators who extended copyright from life to life for 70 years and extended it retrospectively. You know, you can't fix the orphan works problem. That's for us to create, fix, I mean. Um, I'm not entirely being cynical here, but the problem with um, uh, having a system in which a group of extremely well-connected and uh, wealthy um, celebrities uh, with high access to public officials compete with a large group of dead um, and unfindable people. No, I, I speak for the orphans, right? It's not that powerful, right? Um, as opposed to John Grisham uh, standing up and saying we should extend copyright. 
So there are some concerns that I have uh, about the idea Congress could fix it. Ironically, I think the Google Book Search uh, initiative has made the possibility of real orphan works legislation the most credible that it has ever been. Because when I talk about this, the 20th century black hole, which I've been railing about for years and years and years, Mark Webbing can, can testify to this. I, this is not my first rant on the subject. It is, it is perhaps the hundredth. Um, People didn't used to get excited until they had the experience of what it could mean. Of course, librarians got excited because they dealt with the daily insanity of it every day. But ordinary people didn't understand it until they said, wait, you mean I could get the books just like from Google? Like the books? The actual books? That's what my son said to me when he was 10. I was trying to research a book. And I go to the Library of Congress and I click and I, he says, I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to find out if this is the right book. He goes, this is what you do, Dad. And he goes on to the title, which is hyperlinked, and he clicks it. And he gets, you know, this is in the reading room, it's not available. And he goes, clicks it. Nothing comes up. He goes, Dad, where do you go to get the book? That is the assumption of his generation, right? <laughs> the assumption of our generation is, let's make the law and the technology so you can't. Google Book Search, on the one hand, has the possibility of making possible a world where you click to get the book. And that is amazing. But it also has these monopoly concerns, these privacy concerns, these concerns about um, access, these control, uh, concerns uh, about whether or not we want to make a private uh, company effectively the custodian of what is the new digital library of Alexandria. Now, if I were designing the system from the start, I'd repeal the copyright term extensions, I'd go back to 28 years renewable for whatever, I'd do all of that, and the possibility of that happening I think is exactly zero. We'd have to change not only our law, but a lot of international conventions to do it. So here we have it. Our current legal situation and the lobbying, uh, the, the world of interest groups make it effectively a quagmire, a deadlock in which it's unlikely, it's hard for us to get effective orphan works legislation and impossible for us to get access to the commercially unavailable books. Google has created something which for the first time makes that possible. I do support modifications to the settlement. I think the Justice Department actually has some nice ideas about it. I do worry about the privacy concerns. So I, I'm very respectful of the views of Brewster and Pam and the other people who I talked about, who I think genuinely believe that this would be a bad thing, at least in its current form. But I think there is also a belief that it is infinitely malleable, that we can keep adding conditions and adding conditions and adding conditions and at a certain point, the deal's not going to get done. That would be a tragedy. Because actually, I think the best way for people to change this is to have it available and then to say, I don't like the conditions under which this is available. I want it better. I want it with more privacy. I want it in my library. I want two computers. I want, and so forth. But again and again, we see that people care about things that they have and then they want them in an improved form. Getting them to care about something that they've never experienced is just really hard. So I think that that fundamental lesson about human psychology is being lost. We have a crime of the century. This is an imperfect, privately coordinated uh, settlement by parties who are not perfectly representative of the groups, and that's true. You know why that's true? Because if they were perfectly representative, we wouldn't get a deal. Or to put it another way, it would be hard to get the cemeteries and the orphans together in order to come to agreement. That's the whole point about the current situation we're in. So part of the defects of the Google deal, it's unrepresentative, are also its strengths. That's why they can cut the deal. Yes, the Authors Guild is making out like a bandit uh, while not fully representing authors. I agree. But if, as a result, we get our digital library of Alexandria, I'll be very, very happy. And I think we should be too, even though Google's feet should be held to the fire a little longer to make the deal better. Let's not burn down our digital library of Alexandria in the hope that we'll make it a perfect one. Thank you. Questions? Getting back to your comments on uh, perfect 10, 
Uh, that just always reminded me of a slightly earlier case in that circuit. Uh, Mr. Reba versus Kelly. Yeah. Uh, would you say that perfect 10 was on all fours for that case? No. No, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> um, so similar, similar kind of case, the Ariba uh, soft case, uh, also involving um, also involving thumbnails. Um, the court in that case uh, did two things. It, it, it issued an opinion which it subsequently revised because it realized that the first opinion was really bad. Uh, I think the second opinion was only slightly bad. Um, uh, the, the Ninth Circuit, like all of us, moves to perfection through vanishingly small increments. Um, uh, I think that um, there are elements in the fair use analysis of uh, Kelly that are exactly the same as Perfect Ten. This is sort of lawyer inside baseball stuff. But some of the focus on transformativeness in the fair use. I think the key difference uh, in the Arebasoft case is the focus on the display right. Um, and frankly, I think that was simply wrong. Uh, the, that is, Kelly's case was simply wrong. Um, and I was particularly irritated because uh, two of the judges in the, the case had clerks who had been in my class, so I felt a personal responsibility uh, for that one. Um, having said that, I think that there are signals from the Ninth Circuit that they like the Perfect Ten case better. Uh, they seem to be citing it more, referring to it more. It seems to be getting more scholarly attention. So I totally agree with you. There are, and, and his point is a larger one, there are other cases out there that would go very much against the style of analysis that I gave for the fair use. Other uh, people who would look at the uh, Google book search case and say, this is not fair use at all, and would go through the factors exactly the way that I first did. And that's why I said I think it's 6535, and some people think it's, it's rather different. Um, so it's, it's certainly an area of legal uh, uncertainty, and that's one of the reasons, I think, why Google settled. If the settlement falls through and it goes to litigation, which court would it be under? Would it be under the United States District, or would it be something? Um, to be honest, I, I, it, right now it's in, I think, the Eastern District of New York, um, and it, so Second Circuit, so I think it would stay there, but I just don't know, um, because there would be some complicated removals. Also, if it goes to litigation now, everything is very different. Because when Google first did this, um, they could claim very convincingly that there was no market for these commercially unavailable and orphan works, right? So this is a key part of it. We're not harming a market because there is no market, right? We're making something available that never was. The fact that everyone has been talking about commercially exploiting the orphan works and the commercially unavailable works under the Google Book settlement ironically, I think, will set up in the judges the idea like, oh, there could be a market. So the fact that the book settlement tried and failed to create a market could be used recursively to go back and say, so you see, it was never a fair use in the first place. Well, not better in the uh, not better in the larger social sense, but um, if you're arguing fair use, it may be better. I mean, there's, there's a nice analogy. So. Um, when I first went to law school, uh, in the United States at least, it was assumed that professors could photocopy pretty much as, you know, large chunks of books and articles and hand them out to their student in course packs. And that that was a fair use because the copyright statute said multiple copies for classroom use. And that was a fair use, right? And so everyone goes, ah, it's a fair use. Or they just, mostly professors, they just didn't care. They just send it out to their research system and told them to copy it. And everyone said, wow, this is great, this is great, this is great. And then in a, dis in a decision called the Kinko's case, a district court case, I think not very well um, argued uh, case, uh, the judge said this isn't a fair use because it's a commercial copy shop. And so an existing organization called the Copyright Clearance Center starts saying, well, you can license everything through us. And the Copyright Clearance Center gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and starts charging um, permissions fees for ever smaller amounts of material. Um, I have actually looked, I get money out of this as a copyright holder, and I've looked at some of the excerpts that people are licensing, and they're like a paragraph long. It's like, this is fair use, you don't need to pay for this. Uh, in my view, it would be fair use even if it were 10 pages long. Um, that market now exists. Thus, when a rather better and smarter court revisited the issue 10 years later, they said, wait, there is a market for permissions fees for reproducing packets, reproducing portions of books in packets. Whereas the first time, they could have said, I wasn't going to assign the whole book anyway. There's no loss to the market, convincingly, because there was no market. The market had been created by basically industry acquiescence and acceptance. 
And this is one of the reasons, fair use is one of these things where if it's, it's like those organs where if you don't use them, they atrophy, right? If you don't use fair use, it goes away because then people say, well, you better pay me. And then they use the fact that people have paid as evidence there's a market for paying in order to argue it was never a fair use in the first place. There's a circularity in the way that we think about it. So I think that the settlement is problematic, a failed settlement. I'm not saying it would necessarily do this, but it might convince a judge that there's much more of a prospect of a future market for orphan works and commercially non-available works. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I actually, after, if, if the settlement failed and it went back to litigation, I think that whatever percentage you started at that you thought it was gonna be fair use, you'd have to come down 10 or 15% from there.